Hello and welcome to our Diversity of Ocean Life video. In this video, we'll recognize how we classify marine organisms. We'll list the factors used to divide the ocean into marine zones and describe where most benthic organisms live. And then finally, we'll return to the hydrothermal vents one more time. So we have three basic classifications of marine organisms. And where they live and how they move is going to be kind of how we classify them at best. So when we look at these, what we're talking about is we'll start off with our plankton. And our plankton are going to be drifters. They are at the mercy of the waters of the ocean. What means is if there's in waves, if there's currents, the winds, all of these things are going to move these animals around. And that's their way of motion. They may have independent motions, but for the most part, they're at the mercy of the elements. Now, stepping away from those are the nectin, and the nectin we could call our swimmers. And our swimmers have the ability to choose their directions. Now, at some times they might get caught up in something, so they might be more planktonic than nectonic, but for the most part they have the ability to choose their direction, and this is where we see most fish and things of that nature. And then finally we have the benthic organisms, or the benthos, and these are the ones that are going to live down on the bottom. And they're not affected by the water as much, but they'll live at the bottom of the ocean. And that's how we'll classify marine organisms. So if it's like a crab, which is going to live down on the bottom, that would be a benthic organism. We can have a swimming organism, much like a shark would be swimming through the ocean. And then we can have our plankton, our drifters, and that could be something like a man of war or some jellyfish, even though they have the ability to swim short distances, they're really more at the mercy of currents than being able to swim on their own. So this is how we classify them in three basically large clumped categories. Okay, so let's divide the ocean into marine life zones. And we can do this by three different classifications. The first one is if we look at sunlight, so available sunlight. Now we have two different regions of the ocean. We have the photic zone and we have the aphotic zone. The photic zone is from the surface down as far as light can penetrate into the oceans. Below that, it's a dark ocean. There's no sunlight getting there, and that's what we call the aphotic zone. In the aphotic zone, we can't have any photosynthesis because there's no light going down there allowing photosynthesis to happen. But we can have it in the photic zone, so that's where we would see phytoplankton. Now, as light penetrates through the ocean, it gets absorbed, it gets scattered, it gets bounced, so that's why we have this limit of light penetration. And the surface waters, we generally will call this the euphotic zone, and this is where we see the bulk of photosynthesis occurring in the ocean. Next up, let's talk about water depth. How deep is the ocean? So when we're talking about that, we can have our surface, and then we have our bottom part of the ocean. And basically, we break it up into this pelagic zone, which is going to be open ocean. And we'll break that down to the benthic zone, which is going to be the bottom. So you can see that the benthic zone is all along the bottom of the ocean. It's this shallow little layer right above the, the bottom. And the rest of it is going to be the open ocean or pelagic zones. And then the final way we categorize is from distance from shore. Okay, And when we're looking at distance from shore, this is where we go back to our continental margin and our breaks. And at the end of the continental shelf, where the continental slope begins, that starts the oceanic zone. Above the continental shelf, we call this the neuritic zone. Okay, so the neuritic zone would be over the continental shelf, and then the rest of the water is going to be oceanic. There's one other kind of variation we'll have, and that's right up on the shoreline, and that's what we call our intertidal zone. And that's the distance between high tide and low tide. So if you're walking at the beach, first part you would get to is a high tide, and that would be part of the intertidal zone, and that's the farthest up that water can go because of the tides. And you can take that down to low tide, and below the low tide mark, you would get into the neuritic mark because there's always going to be water there. And if you continue to walk, once you got to the edge of the continental shelf, you'd find yourself in the oceanic zone. So we have three different ways that we can quantify where life works, so where we can classify where we have our areas. And we can join those together and make different things. So we can talk about the euphotic zone and the neuritic zone being together, or you can talk about an oceanic aphotic zone, which would be pelagic, which would be this watery area somewhere out in here. Okay, so 
By joining these together, we can be a little more precise, but this is how we break up the oceans. Okay, so let's talk about hydrothermal vents a little bit more. When I was in high school, we believed that all energy for life came from the sun. What we discovered not too long ago was that there were these communities down at the bottom of the ocean. And these communities were thriving. There was a lot of life there, more than that could survive from just this raining down of like dead organisms. This is something that had to produce life-giving energy, so sugars. We found these hydrothermal vents, and you can see in this picture over here, you can see this black smoke rising up from the bottom. Okay, And you can see that there's life here. In the drawing, we can see it a little bit more. One of the first ones that they noticed were these tube worms, these vestimentiferin worms that can grow to be six feet long. And inside of these feathery appendages, they found bacteria. And that bacteria was able to take this hydrogen sulfide that was coming out of these vents. And through chemosynthesis, it was able to create sugars. So now once we have this source of sugars, we can get animals that will feed on those. These dandelions will feed on this, this bacteria. Some of the shrimps will, some of the microbes themselves will, the mussels are able to filter out this stuff. And then once we have this base layer, then we start seeing some of these advanced predators like our zooarchid fishes, our crabs again, our octopus, things of that nature. So we have these entire ecosystems that are down at the bottom of the ocean feeding off of these black smoke vents. And this is how they make their energy, is taking that superheated hydrogen sulfide water, these bacteria are able to convert that into sugar, and that's how we get this whole life system going on at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so that's it for our video. As always, good luck on the quiz, and we'll see you in the next video.